And I want to share with you that I heard about this, this man who just graduated from university, freshly graduated, and he applied for his first job. No experience. And he gets the chance to have the interview. And the person who was running the interview asked this man, so what is your salary expectation? And the man says, well, uh, it should be in the neighborhood of $200,000. Depends on benefits. And the man who was running the interview said, okay, what do you think to begin with? Five weeks holidays, full medical and dental, a car leased by the company that is going to be replaced every two years. And we also pay for your lease of an apartment close to the business. And the young man looks at this and says, whoa, are you kidding me? And I said, of course I am, but you started. <laughs> so I want to talk to you today about it's no joke. <laughs> it's no joke. You will see why I'm saying this. But first, I, there is a beautiful message that I learned many years ago that I truly have every Shabbat when the, the, I see the symbols of Shabbat. To me, the symbols of Shabbat are the candles, the wine, and the challah. And I learned that each one of these three elements represents something else, a different aspect of our lives. For example, the candles represent spirituality. That is, that you will see, for example, when uh, you go to a Shiva house, or when you're observing a yurt site, we light a candle that represents the soul. The Shabbat candles also represent the light of creation, but light and fire in general in Judaism represents spirituality. So when you see the Shabbat candles, you should remember that part of your life should be spirituality. But we also have the wine. And in Judaism, the wine represents joy. It's very simple. There is nothing uh, esoteric about the wine. Wine represents joy, happiness. It represents having fun sometimes. That's why we have the wine there to remind us that that should also be part of our life. We can't spend our life being bitter uh, and being haunted by things. We have to be able to bring joy into our lives as well. And we also have the bread, the challah. And bread in general, it represents the material world. It's a reminder that, yes, we have the Shabbat, but we also have the other six ways of the week where we work. When we have the opportunity to work, to support our families, ourselves, to give tzedakah, but we need to do work. So we have the three elements. And usually, when we come to Shabbat, we should reflect to bring some harmony to the three elements. You see, you can dedicate your life to live in perpetual joy. You can't go from party to party and then neglect work and spirituality. Life doesn't work that way. Sometimes what happens is some people will be work, 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 and they will also neglect the spirit, and they will never have any fun. But we also know people that it will be exclusively spirituality. They detach themselves from reality, from the, from the world, and they dedicate life to... Uh, to feed their souls and nothing else. So Shabbat is a reminder that we should put together these three things. But I believe that there is more than that. Because sometimes we are so concerned to feed all those three things, even if in harmony, that we forget to look around. Let me tell you why. Because even though these three things are an invitation to have balance, it's usually my joy, it's usually my work, and it's usually 
my spirituality. Me, me, me. And we know Shabbat is also a time of reflection when we look around. You see, when God celebrated the first Shabbat, it was also a time of contemplation of the entire creation of the world. It was after God was able to watch and to look at the entire creation and God said, it's very good. It's the concept of responsibility. It's the concept of regardless of your spirituality, your joy, and your work, we should have time to look around and to see, and to see if things are good, very good, or bad. And I'm bringing you, bring you this because, you see, I've been a little bit uh, upset, let's put it that way. This past week should be a moment of celebration, which I went through kind of the day. But I would agree that most people felt it awkward. Canada Day was an awkward day in Canada this year. And I don't know how much our international viewers know what was going on in Canada in these days and why Canada Day was an awkward moment. And, and I, will, I will give you a little bit of a background. If you want, after the, serv after the service, you can go Google and read what's going on. It's because, uh, when was it, a couple of weeks ago, there was discovered 215 graves of kids from the Kamloops Indian Residential School. Unmarked graves. It was a mass grave. Something that many people said that they were always there, but nobody there to, to search for them. But they finally came out, and it triggered a whole new level of introspection and brought into light many unsolved issues that we had here in Canada. We know that we have many things to do to bring peace, truth, and reconciliation with the indigenous people in Canada. But again, you should go and read a little bit what these residential schools were. It's a terrible thing. And that, at the end of the day, of course, it opened dialogues. I've seen posts on Facebook, uh, seen people talking here, talking there. And it kind of ended up during Canada Day with some acts of vandalism, if you want to call it, that is, uh, it's always uncomfortable, at least for me to see stuff like that. But it's a reflection of why things happened the way that happened. Because let's be honest, this, didn't, this uh, tension didn't start a couple of weeks ago with this and Mark Graves. Uh, I'm new to Canada. I was born in Argentina. But I've been hearing about the Truth and Reconciliation Project for a long time from now. It's something that started in 2008, concluded in 2015. There were documents written. And I guess I was uh, trying to find the right word. I wouldn't say lucky, but privileged to hear some of these stories firsthand from a dear friend of our family that he's a lawyer who litigates on behalf of some of the indigenous people. So I heard many of these things from his direct recollection of facts. So I've been involved and uh, aware of what's going on for a long time. And I would say that many of the people were aware as well, but I guess there was the perception that not much was done. And tension started to grow. Then we have what we saw this past Canada Day. And what, do I, what am I bringing you this today? Because somehow reminds me of what happened in this week's Parsha. This week's Parsha is the, is the continuation of last week's Parsha, where we are introduced to a big issue, big problem within the Jewish people. They were sinning with the Midianites. So they, they, it says that the Jewish men were sinning with the women of Midian. You can imagine what kind of sin we are talking about. I don't want to describe it too much in case there are kids watching this service. But you can probably picture what was going on there. And God said that that was wrong. 
And God specifically had Moses, asked Moses to ask the officials to put an end to that. And you know what happened? Nothing happened. He says that Moses was paralyzed. The officers didn't do anything. As for all the people, it's very graphic. It's very interesting that say that everybody else was weeping at the entrance of the tent of the meeting. So people were crying. They were, they were weeping. They, they couldn't believe it. It's not that they, they were not aware. It's not that they were not saddened by what's going on. But they were weeping. And then eventually, it says that they, I guess because nobody was doing anything, there was this prince from Israel that they were sitting with this princess from Midian right in front of Moses. And nothing happened until it says that Pinchas, this zealot, got a spear and killed them both in front of everybody. And then that brought calm to the people of Israel when he did that. And then, of course, year after year, we analyze how is that possible. We try to understand Pinchas. Some people will defend Pinchas. Some people will attack Pinchas. But long story short, God gave Pinchas what is called a Brit Shalom, a covenant of peace. That was the quote-unquote reward that he got. It's kind of awkward for a reward to receive a Brit Shalom, a covenant of peace from God. But the thing is that even though he seems to bring peace, to the people of Israel, if you dare to, walk, to go to the Torah and, and read the way the word shalom is written there, the central vav, the letter o of shalom, is broken in the middle. That's almost saying that, yeah, maybe he brought shalom, but it's not the best way of bringing shalom. And we all know in history that sometimes an act of violence could trigger eventual peace. But the Torah is saying it's not the right way. So what is the right way? Well, the right way is when other people around Pinchas will do what they're supposed to do, which is to do something. Moses didn't do anything. The officer didn't do anything. People were weeping. You see, when I read this, that they were weeping, to me it's a very passive thing. It's like in these days I've seen many people posting things on social media and commenting about other people's, uh, other people's posts and so forth, but it's, it's, it's like weeping. It's like weeping. There is nothing concrete. So when I read this, this Parsha, I would say that we all want peace. We all want truth, reconciliation, friendship, understanding, Restoration, you name it. But weeping doesn't do anything. Talking to each other, maybe. But there is something more that we have to do. Because if we don't, we are fueling the pinchas around. And that's not what we want. We want a peace. We want a shalom where the vav is complete. It's not broken in the middle. And in order to do that... We have to do. To do what? Not 100% sure yet. But I think that is something that we have to figure out among ourselves. We have to find ways to create something to do. It's almost like it reminds me to the Haftorah that we read today. When God appointed Jeremiah and said, God said to Jeremiah, you have a very important job to do. And Jeremiah said, but I'm like a child. I don't know what to do. And God said, don't worry. Start moving. And along the way, I'm going to help you. But you have to give the first step and to start moving. And when you do, I will give you the inspiration to do something that it, that it will make a difference in this world. So as a reflection, I would like to challenge everyone to stop weeping. <laughs> Perhaps 
we can help each other to do something so we can bring a complete shalom, so we can create peace, friendship, understanding, truth, etc. It's very important. It's no joke. Shabbat shalom, everyone.